November 4th, 2008. It's a historic day that will forever be etched in the annals of time. And why is that? Because I finally decided to stop slacking off and actually do this rock tunnel thing. But before we actually get there, I would like to come back on something Lieutenant Surge said about his Pokémon saving him in the war. Well, Repto of Libeldra raised the point that if Pokémon were used during the war, whichever war it is, well, it wasn't just Pokémon on Pokémon battles like we're seeing now, but rather that Pokémon were used to attack enemy soldiers. Now this is just speculation, there's no evidence that it actually was like that, but if it was like that, then using Pokemon in, in times of war would be essentially the same thing as emptying a clip of an AK-47 into your enemy's chest. Which is not exactly an image you want to convey with such a low-wage target audience, but that's probably why they didn't go in-depth at all when it came to that war Lieutenant Surge was talking about. So anyway, I'm gonna heal myself before entering the rock tunnel, and I gotta say, while I hate that place, it's far from being the most annoying dungeon ever. Uh, when it comes to games that I've played, the grand champion of annoying dungeons would be Latian Gorge in Tales of Symphonia. If you don't remember which one it is, well, it's the one where you fly around using flowers that spew out gusts of wind, and it's also a, a gigantic maze where if you mess up on uh, one of the puzzles, you start a long way back, which I really, really hated. I swear, I hate that place so much that whenever I reach it, I turn off the game and don't touch it for a couple of days until one day I feel like doing it for whatever reason. I don't know what kind of reason I can come up with because that place is the be-all, end-all annoying dungeon. You'd be hard-pressed to do something even more frustrating than that. It's that bad for those who haven't played the game. Another one that I'm not terribly fond of, and from what I've seen no one is, is the Phoenix Cave in Final Fantasy VI. Now, some people hate it enough that they keep it for last, just before heading for Kefka's Tower, but personally I don't do that. I want to get Locke as early as I can, because he needs a lot of Esper boosts in order to do some decent damage with the physical attacks, and since he's my primary physical attacker, well, of course I'm going to need those boosts. And since he's mandatory if you want to get the Paladin Shield or Ragnarok, whether it's the Esper or the Sword... Okay, so while I'm talking now, I'm heading into the Rock Tunnel finally, so it's time for that drowsy I caught to do its stuff. Anyway, as I said, the, it's very rewarding to get him as early as possible, at least at, when you can fill out two parties of four. So, yeah, that's what I do. And one... Oh, you gotta be kidding me! Another random battle already? I haven't even fought a single trainer! And the, the, the encounter rate is already getting to me! I, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to get through that place with my sanity in one piece, but oh whatever, it's not like it's that difficult, it's just really annoying. So anyway, I was wondering, how come the rock tunnel is dark that I can buy, since there's no sunlight that gets in there? But how about the other tunnels where I don't need flash? Where's the light coming from? Mount Moon, for instance, how's it so well lit? Are there light bulbs all over the place on the ceiling or something? Because I don't need flash because the place is lit like it's in broad daylight, which of course isn't the case because it's underground, but oh well, maybe I should stop thinking about that since it really doesn't make any sense. Not that there are many things in the Pokemon world that make sense, but whatever. Which reminds me, while I'm talking about lighting in really unreasonable places, well, the Earth Temple in Wind Waker, it's supposed to be at the bottom of the sea, okay? And yet, there are holes in the walls and ceilings and stuff that let light through, even though I can't imagine there being any light at the bottom of the sea, so... 
Oh well, let's stop with the tangents and back to the rock tunnel, okay? The, if I remember, the major threat in this place is a hiker with a few, with a couple of Jew dudes that know self-destruct, and of course they're slow enough that they should be taken out in one hit, but if you somehow fail to do that, then you're exposing yourself to a detonation, and one thing I should note is that self-destruct and explosion in this generation are slightly weaker than in other generations. And first things first, just to get this out of the way, in all generations, those two moves have subroutines that temporarily have the defense of the opponent, so technically their power, which is already excessively high, is doubled on top of that. So when it comes to the power of those moves, in red, blue and yellow, self-destruct and explosion have 130 and 170 power, respectively, as opposed to 200 and 250 in all other generations. And it's a good thing that there's this defense having subroutine, else there would be something that makes no sense as far as red, blue and yellow self-destruct goes. So because Self-Destruct has 130 power, Double Edge 120, so for only 10 extra power, you're, you're changing some recoil into instant death for you. Now in the first generation, Snorlax's Self-Destruct is known as the single most damaging non-boosted attack in the game, so that means if there were no defense having subroutine, you could afford to sacrifice just 10 power and you could actually live through that attack. See where I'm going with this? If self-destruct really only had 130 power as advertised, there would be absolutely no point in using it over double edge, but since its power is actually 260, still only in red, blue and yellow, then there's no problem you can use it and pretty much be sure of taking down your opponent, whatever it is. Now as you probably noticed, I keep running into dead ends in this rock tunnel. I don't know why they designed it that way, why they didn't put some items as worthless as they could be, and that's actually what they did in Fire Red and Leaf Green. They added items in this place because in red, blue and yellow there are absolutely none, so it it helps makes this boring dungeon even more boring because there's no loot you can collect in order to compensate for all the annoyance of all those random encounters because when you head into one of those dead ends it guarantees you're going to see one or two wild Pokemon along the way. And there's even a Rock Slide move tutor in there to replace the Rock Slide TM that... Wait, you use tiny Pokemon because big ones are too scary, yet you're looking for challengers to battle you and you're trying to win? I, at least I assume that you're trying to win? So if you stop yourself from using big Pokemon, which are in most cases the strongest Pokemon, well, what's the point in being a trainer to compete in battles and try to win? Once again, horrid, horrid career choice. And here we have a cosplay fan. Personally, I think cosplayers are a bit creepy. Not creepy in when it comes to their looks, but more what's between the ears. Because I don't know what drives one to think that, unless it's Halloween of course, I don't know what drives one to think that cosplaying is a good idea. Because usually, cosplayers fail miserably to represent what they're supposed to be. There are a few cases of actual successful cosplay, but nah, usually it's a failure. Especially, there's one that I've seen a few years back, a really, really fat girl trying to cosplay as Riku from Final Fantasy X. Yeah, miserable, miserable failure as you can imagine, because, uh, and it's not just uh, the 200 pounds in excess, the clothing was also uh, really uh, pitiful. Okay, I'm gonna take down this thing, and after that, I am going to stop for now, so join me next time, whenever that is, for more Rock Tunnel!